Life. Want some tequila? Uh, sure. <laughs> we'll share it. Okay. I started to use different kinds of materials because I was looking for some kind of new way to paint. I mean, the world existed before I showed up. I'm just basically reacting to it. Working with things that already exist affords you associations that are beyond your invention. I just saw it five minutes ago. Really? You just showed it to me. <laughs> Should we go over there? Yeah, yeah. Ah, the bench is here. That was fast. Well, you kind of started off on a park bench with uh, the Boone. With Boone. <laughs> we did, yeah. We used to do that. Right. Like that. The skylights used to be here. Okay. So I put the skylights on the end of the building. Actually, we should just turn the lights off for a minute. Okay, so Gino and Joe, why don't you just turn that painting around right over there for a second? Wow, that's great, man. The light's beautiful in there. That's how we do it. That one over there, the name of this painting is uh, Carrot is a Diamond to a Rabbit, which is based on a Captain Beefheart song. Anyway, should we sit down? Let's sit down. I mean, Rockets was the one that sort of brought me into the fold. Right. And then, of course, with Boone, then, right. you know, we should... Yeah, because Rockets did stand up, too. Yeah, he used to do the, the Rockets was... regular taxi cabaret. Right. At Club 57 and, and other and places. And remember James Nairs, made, who made... Oh, my God. Right, he made, Rome. The, he made the best movies. Right. When did your interest in film, as far as being a writer-director, come about? I never thought I was going to be a movie director. No. But I was a huge movie fan. I must have seen the Ten Commandments, I don't know, every day after school, because I loved the way the Red Sea split up. I just had to keep seeing that. Do you remember your first movie? My first movie was on Manhattan Avenue in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, at the Chopin Theater, was uh, Planet of the Apes. Oh, mm. man, that had an effect on me, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Statue of Liberty. And the whole... Yeah. Uh, Pardon of the Sea, that was one of my favorite scenes also. Yeah, in the Ten Commandments? Yeah. No, they had the Parting of the uh, Sea in the, in, the, in the Planet of the Apes also. Oh. No. <laughs> yeah. But the first movie that I really saw, Repulsion by Roman Polanski. Oh. I had no idea what I was going to see. I mean, actually, there How was... How old were you? Um, what, 13 or 14 years old. Okay. First of all, there was a short. There's a guy on the beach, and he's fishing. And he's fishing, and he's fishing for a while, and then he's hungry. So he picks up this paper bag, and he gets his sandwich out, and he eats a sandwich. And then he starts scrounging around on the beach for more stuff. And you, so he sees a candy bar, and he's happy, and he eats that, and he's looking around for some other stuff. And all of a sudden, he sees another paper bag. And he opens it, and there's a sandwich in it. And he takes a bite out of it, and a hook comes through his cheek, and he gets reeled into the ocean. <laughs> that was the short before Repulsion. That was the short before Repulsion. Repulsion. And then I watched Repulsion, and I thought, wow, there's a different kind of movie that you can make that right. doesn't look like anything that I've right. seen or understood as movies. So what gave you the confidence or whatever it is to say, well, I'm going to write a script about my friend and make a movie of it? I thought that Jean-Michel Basquiat deserved to have somebody tell the story that knew right. something about it. And so a guy showed up in my studio. I had no idea what being a producer was or seed money. Well, I gave him $50,000. I said, okay, you should interview this person and that person. I said to him that you have to talk to Dennis Hopper because you got Andy Warhol totally wrong. After going through all of this, I realized that a tourist was going to make this movie. So I rewrote the script and said, I'll just do it myself. Because mm -hmm. I thought, I'm a painter. I know about this particular topic. And all the people that were in the movie, like Dennis Hopper, Chris Walken, Willem Dafoe, right. Gary Oldman, all these guys were interested in painting. 
and they were all friends of mine, so they really just did me a favor. Right. Like you did. I mean, you just showed up. The very first uh, reading. So when we showed the movie in Cuba, mm -hmm. they thought I was a communist filmmaker because basically everybody worked for free. Uh, and it showed that a talented black person couldn't survive in the white capitalistic art world, New York City. And, wow. you know, so it was, uh, it was seen as a heroic gesture. Right. right. Going down there, seeing what was happening. Uh, and then I came across... Rinaldo Arenas, his book, Before Night Falls. This woman named um, Esther Percal, who was a Jewish Cuban, called herself a Juban. She'd seen Basquiat and had this black market video that she gave to me. She said, I think you'll like this. I saw Rinaldo Arenas and he was talking to the camera saying, you know, I, I'm homosexual, I'm anti castrista I've got all the qualities of never being published. Mm -hmm. And I just thought he was so funny, and it's that, you know, the book was so great. That, that movie is so beautiful, and I remember seeing it. I was at the premiere, and I always love when people are able to break out of what they're known for, and, and you made it your own. I think that just defied everybody's expectations. It seemed very natural for me to make a movie. It wasn't a problem. Being somebody that built things or did th something, things that were physical, you know, I, I shot 60 days in the rainy season in Mexico without stopping once for weather. You know, I just, if the ri river came up, I just turn the camera in another direction or I tell everybody, okay, take your clothes off and run that way and the truck's gonna follow you and the army guys are gonna run after the truck. Basically, my attitude is you just throw everybody in the hole and you jump in with them and if you can crawl out, you get to go home. Right. I wanna ask you about um, your paintings. What is it about you know, working big that appeals to you? Did you start small? Well, it's funny that we're sitting here because the work that's around here is all quite small. Yeah. Really. Uh, but these are actually the actual size of these signal flags that people use on boats. The first paintings, yeah, they were around six by four feet. They were never really small. But, you know, I've made paintings that are 50 feet tall. So I like to step into them. They become intimate when you get close. They envelop right. you in a way. Why don't we talk about these yeah. things? Because Really, you need to stand in front of it and look at it and see how it's made. If you look at this, you notice that this red thing is not painted. It's sewn Stitched in here. Stitched in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I didn't sew it in here. Somebody that made the flag did that. Right. This cross was there, and this was white, but I put some purple ink on here, and I put a hose on it, and then I put some cerulean blue and sprayed on top of it with spray paint, and it's a painting. It's not a picture of something, it is a thing. So if it was a signal that meant something before, obviously it doesn't mean the same thing now. I kind of commandeered its prior meaning for some other meaning. What do you see when you look at a painting anyway? The nice thing about paintings is that they're static. I don't want paintings to be movies, and I don't want movies to be paintings. So you don't want paintings to tell a story? You know, I'm telling you this now. If yeah. you didn't know... Right. What I just told you, have you'd to have to look at this and right. think, okay, there's a sort of pictorality in this. There's a deep right. space with this. There's a map here. But then these marks look like they're very man-made or human marks. Mm -hmm. So there's the contrast between something that's human and something that's inhuman. Mm -hmm. And that conflict is one way that something could go. I mean, we could look, let's look at this painting over yes. here because... What would happen if we turn the lights off? Let's try it. Your cameras could sort of adjust to it and start to see this painting in a different way. But you might see there's like a red line going through there and they have a lot to do with the time of day. Mm -hmm. Painting outside is something that I like to do because I see the painting in all different kinds of light. And I'll say that if you make a painting outside, it'll always look better inside. But if you paint inside and you take it outside, it's like a girl in the bathroom putting makeup on, you know? She can't tell what it really looks like. She'd come out, she'd have purple cheeks right. or something right. like that. Uh, there were no windows in my studio when I made the first plate painting, and I didn't think, I thought all the light I needed to see was in my head. Mm. Later, I figured that it's nicer to work outside. Natural in daylight, light. yeah. But is there, so, so what's your favorite time of the day to paint, or does it matter? Well, if I paint portraits of people, I'm walking um, over to the plate painting, but yes. Th yeah, there's not a, there, that's unfinished. That's unfinished. Okay. Can we look at it anyway? Sure, what the hell? 
So I'm sorry, so... Actually, there might be light coming through here and we could turn yeah. the light off. Watch what will happen here. What it is is a jetty's coming out of the beach in Lazoot. So watch what happens. Let the lights go down, Joe. Obviously, the painting's not finished, but you start to see the pictorality of the thing. Now, if we turn the lights on, right, and then walk towards it, just walk all the way up to the painting, it's pretty damn abstract. You really can't see an image, but you just see the surface of it. And so, there are different kind of paintings that I paint. Tarkovsky, who was a great filmmaker, made one of my favorite movies, Andrei Rublev. He made a book called Instant Light about Polaroids. Mm. And I believe this. Whatever it expresses, even destruction and ruin, the artistic image is by definition an embodiment of hope. It's inspired by faith. Artistic creation is by definition a denial of death. Therefore, it's optimistic, even if in the ultimate sense the artist is tragic. It is a symbol of actual life as opposed to life itself. So, basically, we make things that are a representation of life, so it's a denial of death. And I guess that's why we're involved in this practice.